Hello. Welcome to 2023 Erna Hamburger Prize organized by Wish Foundation. It is a great pleasure to see so many distinguished guests. And also, I would like to thank uh, Center for Quantum Science and Engineering, as well Mediacom of EPFL for organizing and helping us organize this ceremony. Uh, as well, I would like to uh, kick start the ceremony by asking Anna von Kuberta Imoral um, to uh, present a uh, little bit to, to start it. Uh, so, Anna von Kuberta Imoral. Uh, so she is uh, vice president uh, for centers and platforms, and also she is a member of a quantum committee in Swiss Academy of uh, Natural Sciences. And uh, on behalf of Direction, she will start a ceremony. Thank you, Alexandra. Madam President of the Swiss Science Council, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in your respective titles and functions, it's my pleasure to welcome you today. It is a tradition that uh, Martin Betterly, our president, or Jan Heshaven, our provost, are here. They really enjoy coming here every time. Unfortunately, this time they couldn't come, so I have to be uh, replacing them. So uh, I will start by explaining uh, the prize, Erna Hamburger. She was the first woman to become a professor at EPFL. This was back in 1957. Um, her topics of research were, uh, she invented the fact a system for optical registration and tone frequencies from ultra short waves. So she was extremely technical. She was a professor in electrical engineering. So if we look at her life uh, and we look at what she contributed, I also have the feeling that she was very committed to equality and, and really that uh, women should be up to the level of men in any task. And, uh, uh, my interpretation is based that she, even in the time that it was not necessary, she attended the military service and, and she even became, was promoted chief of telecommunication troops in 1950. Uh, she also served in other associations that reinforced the role of women, for example, the Swiss Association of Women in Liberal and Commercial Careers and the Association for, of, of University Women of Vo, and also vice president of the International Federation of University Women. So she was an extremely committed person. Uh, when she was named professor uh, in 1957, uh, the president of the school, Maurice Cosandet, announced it is both a brilliant consecration and a measure of backwardness that characterize our country as regards to promotion of women. So we recognize that uh, being the first woman in 1957 was maybe a bit too late. Still, it took, if I recall well, more than 20 years uh, uh, for uh, women professors to be full professors at EPFL. Um, when the WISH Foundation was created uh, in the early 2000s, there was less than a handful of full professors at EPFL. Uh, since then, things have changed significantly. We have uh, about 20% of the professors that are female, and this is the consequence of a real change in mentality and also uh, the way we, we handle the university. It also attracts top females, and in fact, the rankings of EPFL keep going up as soon as we get more female here. <laughs> so now I'd like to also, uh, we're here to honor the excellence in, and leadership in quantum science and technology. So I would like to give some words on where we stand in Switzerland. So Switzerland has invested in quantum science since the early 2000s where uh, the journals were not talking too much about quantum yet. Uh, they were the so-called national centers of competence in research. There were several of them in the topic. There was the one on nano. There was one on uh, quantum photonics. There was one on quantum science and technology. And recently, there is one on spin. So we, uh, Switzerland has been investing a lot in, in quantum. Uh, just a month ago, uh, in the tradition, Swiss tradition also, there was uh, the GESDA, the, the Geneva uh, Science and Diplomacy Anticipator inaugurate the Open Quantum Institute, which is uh, an institute that's supposed to close the gap between the, the North and the South in the domain of quantum to really make sure that, doesn't have, uh, that it doesn't exist any quantum divide within, in the world. Uh, EPFL has played and plays an important role in these endeavors. Uh, we have heavily funded infrastructure and chairs in the, air, uh, in the area of uh, quantum. Uh, co coherent with this, we have created the Center of Quantum Science and Engineering that brings together uh, experimentalists and theoreticians, 
in the area from uh, computer science to physics, passing from engineering, and this has since 2021. Um, so, just to finalize, I just want to say that I'm sure of today's award and I look forward to the lecture and discussion. Uh, thank you, Anna, for uh, these nice words and as well it's very encouraging to see how Direction and uh, EPFL over the years uh, supports the uh, careers of women faculties. Uh, female students and uh, postdocs and all uh, female uh, staff members. Um, so uh, I would like to introduce a little bit uh, what the uh, WISH uh, Foundation, so Women in Science and Humanities, uh, stands for. And before that, I would also like to thank uh, uh, previous uh, President Luisa Lambertini, current uh, Vice President, uh, and as well uh, our ad administrative assistant, or administrative angel, uh, how to say, uh, Valerie Kuderk for all the help in uh, running the foundation. So without time from uh, uh, Luisa, Valerie, and also our board and, uh, uh, and bureau members, um, this uh, foundation would not uh, function. So the foundation um, has been um, uh, established in the 2006 um, with uh, effort of uh, very few uh, female professors, uh, many of them are sitting in this uh, uh, first row, so uh, thank you uh, for starting the foundation. Um, uh, it has been flourishing based on the time that women professors have invested in this foundation. Um, they have not only invested their time, they have invested their ideas, um, their uh, 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 energy and also, I would say, a lot of optimism because uh, optimism is necessary in order to change things. If we don't believe that we can change things, we will not change the things. So thank you, the founding uh, uh, members, uh, uh, for this optimism. And I am optimistic that uh, we will continue on that, on that course. So through our uh, activities, we promote uh, uh, different things. And we are a group of... Uh, a um, group of enthusiasts who are trying to promote um, women in science and humanities. So again, uh, our uh, pictures from the members in the board and the bureau, and this is a, a rare uh, opportunity to uh, thank them for their uh, work, which is a volunteering work. So on top of uh, being a professors, um, this a cohort of uh, uh, professors and uh, colleagues in humanities donate their time um, to uh, work for WISH Foundation in looking for donors, in evaluating the, the master uh, candidates uh, every year, and also uh, proposing um, and uh, having this very difficult task on identifying the laureates for next WISH uh, uh, um, uh, uh, funded Anna Hamburger um, uh, Prize uh, uh, awardee. Um, so I already glanced about uh, some of our activities. So our main uh, activity, uh, as if I could identify it, is uh, really um, to support uh, master students abroad. So we have two calls um, every year. And these are the pictures from um, April uh, selection of the master students, uh, female master students, who are all perceiving uh, later with the uh, stipends of uh, 5,000 um, um, uh, Swiss francs uh, master uh, thesis abroad. So the idea is that uh, to give them um, wings to fly and to be able to network, to uh, uh, learn about uh, new experiences um, uh, somewhere else, so not in Switzerland, so outside of a um, comfort zone uh, of their homes uh, or places where they have been doing their, uh, their studies. So this uh, really empowers them later to uh, likely come back or continue their uh, career somewhere, uh, somewhere else. So we will be having our next uh, um, uh, selection in uh, November. Uh, typically, we award uh, four to five, or these uh, last two rounds we have been awarding exceptionally high numbers, so six, uh, because of the time of the COVID that uh, we have to always a little bit compensate at this point. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so we also organize uh, luncheons, or, which we invite uh, 
uh, really uh, uh, women uh, who have made the mark in industry, science, or uh, humanities, or that have been, uh, for example, the first uh, uh, neurosurgeons at Harvard University uh, to share their uh, stories, their struggles, their um, tips and tricks on how to navigate uh, um, in a still um, a mostly a man uh, world. And as I said, optimism uh, is really strong with us and uh, we are thinking that things are changing uh, for better. Um, so uh, uh, Anna have introduced uh, uh, Edna Hamburger and on, on her behalf, uh, we are also identifying every year uh, Vorti laureate for this, uh, for this prize. Um, and uh, uh, with the help of uh, EPFL uh, Mediacom, we organized this, uh, this uh, ceremony. Um, all uh, this uh, we also do in an in a, in a, uh, uh, organized way with uh, uh, other partners. So uh, associations such as EPFL, ELS, or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, postdoc associations, for example, we organize additional, uh, additional events. Uh, in forms of lunches or career development events, uh, again, where we uh, uh, talk or uh, present our colleagues who uh, are sharing their success stories with different, uh, 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 different students at a different level of, in, in their uh, careers. Uh, we also help in organization of the, the Women's uh, International Day uh, and uh, and uh, 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 try to support uh, uh, female uh, students in every, uh, every possible way. Um, so all this is only possible because we have a strong support from our um, uh, donors and sponsors, so this is also a rare opportunity to uh, thank them. Um, so ranging from uh, companies, uh, small or large, uh, um, uh, ranging also from uh, NCCRs uh, that are also contributing to different, uh, different activities from luncheons to uh, sponsored uh, uh, master programs. Uh, so, uh, dear uh, sponsors, uh, thank you uh, very much for, uh, for support. Uh, so we hope uh, uh, we will be um, uh, continuing in this support. And in order to also a little bit advertise the WISH uh, Foundation, so after the APERO, uh, if you know or you have a contacts with the good companies uh, who are willing to promote women in science, uh, please give them our uh, small brochure where there is more information on how to, um, how to contribute. Uh, so before uh, that, so uh, in the tradition of this uh, uh, ceremony, uh, we also give a chance to the master uh, student and uh, we are very lucky that uh, um, master program in uh, quantum science and engineering also has kick-started at EPFL. Um, and with us, uh, we have uh, Ralia uh, Dai. Uh, she will uh, be introducing our today's laureate. So thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests and advocates of innovation, I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to the EPFL Wish Foundation Council and the presidency of EPFL for the opportunity to participate to the Air Number Girl event. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ghalia Zawi, and I proudly represent the inaugural group and one of the first two women enrolling in a master's degree program in quantum engineering at GPFL. This program has just started last year, and the decision to embark in a journey in quantum science is underpinned by compelling reasons. As its reputation precedes it, the field of quantum diverges from the world of common experience because it defies our attempts of straightforward explanations, which makes it very counterintuitive. So it teases the boundaries of classical physics, and we can see it through head-scratching phenomena, going from wave-particle duality to entanglement and teleportation. And whereas the first quantum revolution helped building transistors and lasers, we are in the midst of a second quantum revolution, where we engineer quantum mechanics to further push the boundaries of computing, for example. We are creating, trying to create quantum computers that surpass classical machines in practical applications. Simultaneously, we are observing significant advancements not only in quantum information networking or cryptography that aims to protect data against eavesdroppers or further than that to create the quantum internet, but also in the field of metrology that has been quantized, leading to unprecedented levels of precision and miniaturization. 
And with my fellow classmates, I share the enthusiasm and confidence that we will make valuable contributions to this remarkable field. Besides, the field of quantum science and technology is striving for better inclusivity and uh, diversity, and women are actively contributing to its advancement in various ways, including research and innovation, education, and leadership roles. And it is a great pleasure for me today to introduce the laureate of the Erna Berger Award 2023, Professor Michelle Simmons, one of the leading world's leading scientists in quantum science, who is at the forefront of research that could bring a major breakthrough in quantum computing. So Professor, Professor Simmons is born and raised in London and attended Durham University, where she pursued her studies in physics and chemistry of materials. And after her postgraduate years at St. Andrews College, she earned a PhD with a thesis on high efficiency solar cells. She continued as a research fellow in quantum electronics at the Cavendish Laboratory in UK, where she became well known for the study of metallic states in very pure transistors and for the discovery of the anomalous feature in the conductance of quantum point contacts known as the 0.7 feature. After these accomplishments, she received the Queen Elizabeth II Fellowship and moved to Australia, where she became a founder member of the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Quantum Computer and Technology. And over two decades, Professor Simmons held important scientific positions, from science professorship in the University of New South Wales to a director of the Research Center of Excellence for Quantum Computation and Communication, where she stood out by building electronic devices at the atomic scale. We mainly cite, here well, the world's smallest transistor, the narrowest conducting wire, 3G atomic electronics, and the first two qubit gate using atom-based qubits in silicon. And in addition to being an inspirational scientist, Professor Simmons is uh, deeply committed to bridging the gap between fundamental research and practical applications and building upon the fundamental breakthroughs in atomic scale transistors in silicon, she founded the Silicon Quantum Computing Company in 2017 with ambitious goals, including the creation of an atomic scale integrated circuit, the development of a 100 qubit quantum processor, and the realization of a narrow corrected quantum computer, all of which are firmly rooted in silicon technology. And during this year, her team achieved remarkable results, including the development of a high precision, long range qubit readout sensors, and the development of a high fidelity CNOT gate for Donald Electron um, spin qubits in silicon. So after hearing these outstanding achievements, you won't be surprised to know that Professor Simmons received over two decades nine awards, including the Posse Medal, the Walter Griffith Prize, the CS0 Eureka Prize for Leadership in Science, and many others. And her significant contributions made her an influential figure among women scientists, as she was named the L'Oréal UNESCO Asia Pacific Laureate in 2017 for Women in Science. So it is clear that she holds a deep commitment into inspiring girls to consider careers in science and technology. And when she received the Australian title in 2018, she said, for her contribution in quantum physics, she said, seeing women in leadership roles and competing internationally is important. It gives them a sense that anything is possible. So <clears throat> with over 400 journal papers, 59 conference papers, and three books, she is an inspiration for women scientists and a role model worth following. And it's truly really a pleasure to extend a warm welcome to Professor Michelle Simmons. I have to give you a hug, that was amazing. <laughs> Well, I have to say, if that isn't one impressive young lady, I don't know what else is. <laughs> I feel very humbled to be speaking after you. Um, so look, really, that was amazing. But um, I want to thank everybody um, for inviting me here today. I've had a fantastic day looking around the laboratories, talking to theorists, um, and realizing that EPFL really supports something that's dear to my heart, not only supporting female scientists, um, but supporting the creation of technologies. You're building things here in the, in the laboratories that you have. You're not just using them, you're building them. And honestly, that is quite rare globally. So, so I've had a wonderful day, and thank, thank you for inviting me. So on the, on the screen at the moment, what you have are atoms of silicon on a silicon 100 surface. So this is the surface that industry typically uses. On that surface, the atoms rearrange because you've cut the top layer off, so they want to get to a lower energy state, and they form these rows of pairs of silicon atoms called dimers. 
Now, I, I love this image I use. It's my backdrop on my computer. But I guess the, the thing that's quite striking and amazing for me is that you know, it's been a long time that people have theorized about the existence of atoms and never seen them. So all the way back to 460 BC, Democritus was the first person that asked the question, if you take matter and chop it in half and chop it in half again and keep going, what is the smallest fundamental unit that you end up with? And he came up with the concept of the atom many, many thousands of years ago. Now, unfortunately for him, um, Aristotle was a much more influential philosopher, and he didn't like the idea. So for more than 2,000 years, it's remained dormant. And if you think about it, it's really only since the 1980s where we've had a microscope that has allowed us to see atoms for the first time. And so really, all of human history, we've kind of thought that atoms exist, but we've never seen them. And so really what my research is about is taking that microscope as an imaging tool and adapting it to essentially a manufacturing tool to put atoms in place so that we can create devices that have never existed before. And the ultimate goal is to try and build a quantum computer with atomic precision. So that's kind of where I'm going to lead you to today. But for, before I start, I will just go back in time. Because I don't think people realize just how much technology has changed dramatically over the last 100 years or so. So here you see some of the original motors. They were large, big, bulky machines that were originally designed to pump water out of mines. You've got clocks. Clocks used to be so big that they were only found in public places, such as cathedrals, churches, or town halls. You've got the Gutenberg printing press, which was you know, twice as high as a man larger than a grand piano and pretty hard to actually use it. And on the right-hand side, you've got some of the earliest computers where they had up to 16,000 vacuum tubes, which were used to turn between on and off states for our digital information. Fast forward 100 years, things have changed dramatically. So now these small, miniaturized electronic motors are found in pretty much everything from washing machines to dishwashers, transportation technologies. Watches, I'm in the land of the precision watch, and I do liken our technology of building quantum computers to building a Swiss watch. It is absolutely the edge of precision. And so obviously, with, with the ability to make watches miniaturized, we've now synchronized the whole world, and that's had a dramatic impact. Printers are now so small, you can buy handheld ones. We have Officeworks in Australia. I don't know if you have that here, but you can literally go there and buy a handheld printer. But I think the defining technology of our era, one that really outstrips all the others, and the others are pretty significant, is the transistor. So on the bottom right-hand side here now, we're at the stage now where we have over 60 billion transistors on a slither of a silicon chip that's about the size of an after-dinner mint. And that technology has changed dramatically over the last 50 years or so. It is the technology that I would call is what we call the elemental gear of our information age. It really has allowed us to process information, to be able to communicate across the globe, to navigate cities, to automate factories, to be able to produce and listen to and enjoy music, video games, and movies, to be able to predict the weather, the financial markets, even the behavior of others, and obviously to send man to the moon and back. But what's surprising about that is really the transistor's only been around for about 70 years or so. And so if you look at the profound impact it's had on our society, it's really immeasurable. So I guess what's interesting for me now is if you look to the future, and you think, what's coming next? What, what technology is coming along that will make even the most powerful supercomputer look primitive? That is the promise of quantum computing. Now, it's obviously not realized yet, and there are huge teams across the world trying to realize it. Billions and probably trillions of dollars are going into that now because it is transformational in the way that it operates. And hopefully, I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse in that as we go through the lecture. Well, so behind the miniaturization of computing has been Moore's law. So Gordon Moore is obviously the co-founder of Intel. He literally looked back in the 70s and 80s, and over a few years of data, he predicted that the number of components on a silicon chip was doubling every 18 months to two years. And what that meant was the actual smallest feature size was decreasing at the same rate. Now, he was fascinated by this, and he came up with what we call the semiconductor roadmap, where he put out every year, what are the technical challenges we need to keep making devices smaller? And so he realized that this, you know, the ability to make it smaller made it faster, the products that were coming out from that people were buying. And so he really wanted to see you know, what will happen if we keep pushing that. And what was really just a few years of observation of data became this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that has lasted decades. And so now we come to expect that every year our devices are going to get smaller and more powerful. For me, what's incredible about this is just you know, the transistor itself has you know, three aspects of it that are amazing. 
most of all, it's effective. It performs calculations over and over again. You can drop it on the floor and it still works. So obviously, if you're going to build any kind of computer in the future, it has to be fairly robust. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So we find them all over. People are using billions and trillions of transistors every day. And then it's ever-changing, so it's always getting better and faster. And so I, in the 2000s, saw this law from the UK, as so I was working in the Cavendish, and I was making these very high-purity devices. And at that time, quantum computing was just about becoming popular experimentally. They had the first demonstrations of what we call error correction, the ability to um, correct for errors in a quantum state using liquid-state NMR. And suddenly people were talking, if, instead of it being a theoretical field where there's this kind of exponential speed up in computational power, suddenly groups across the world were sti starting to figure out, could we actually make one? What was kind of interesting for me at that time was most university teams that were looking at quantum effects were always looking at the materials that were going to surpass silicon. The industry was so big and powerful that basically it owned all the silicon research, partly because of Moore's law. So they had these roadmaps, and industry were funding researchers both in their organizations and outside to work on what was technically useful to get their roadmap working and to, and to time. And so when quantum computing came out, silicon was not really ever considered a material in which you would build a quantum computer. Most people were adapting what they already had, be it superconducting systems, liquid state NMR systems, or even people looking at iron traps or optical systems. And so for me, what was interesting was that silicon itself seemed to be one of those materials that was easily manufacturable. But there were also indications that the coherence time, how long you can hold a quantum state, was actually very large in a silicon system. And so in 2000, I looked, sitting at the Cavendish, this was a field that looked very exciting for me. I could see Moore's law and extrapolated it out in time, which is what you're seeing on the screen here. And basically, I took the punt that A, the silicon industry is going to keep going until it gets to the atomic scale, and B, that I could actually take the technology that existed to actually image atoms, the scanning tunneling microscope, and use it to manipulate atoms. There were some first indications that that was possible from the group at IBM um, using metal atoms on a metal surface. So that's really where I jumped in and basically said, right, that's what I'm going to do. I uh, moved to Australia, and we set up the center of excellence in order to try and build quantum computing machines where the functional element is an individual atom. On the right-hand side over here, I don't remember which one to use. I think it's this one. On the right-hand side here, you have a silicon FinFET. These are the, the um, transistors that are in conventional computers nowadays. This is from the 22 nanometer mode. They're now down below 10 nanometer node. But essentially, it's just a transistor that switches on and off. You have a, literally a, a slither of silicon. It's a fin. Um, you have this oxide, which is white around it, which is an insulator. And then you have this kind of wraparound gate over the top. And if you put a positive voltage on this gate, you suck electrons into the fin, and you turn the transistor on. If you put a negative voltage on this gate, you push electrons out of the fin, and you turn the transistor off. So it's a very simple on-off switch. Um, you can see the size here is about 22 nanometers. But as industry has come down, and they've gone below the kind of 100 nanometer, 50 nanometer, 20 nanometer scale, they're starting to see that the position of every atom within this fin, and there are several thousands of atoms across this fin, every, the position of every atom affects how that transistor turns on and off. So it was very clear that as they come down, it, be it becomes harder and harder to reproducibly make transistors. So the idea of actually putting atoms in place and building it from the bottom up, for me, was very appealing. So that's how I got into the field. So now, what, so what is quantum computing? I know a lot of people in the audience will know this, but I also know some people don't. And so the way that we all look at quantum computing is we talk about it being massively parallel. And to kind of give you an image of what that means, Imagine if I wrote a telephone number down on a piece of paper and I couldn't remember whose number it was. I could go with my classical computer and I could search through all the directories starting at the A's and B's and C's and eventually I would find the right answer. If I wanted to make that faster, I could split the directory in two and have two computers running in parallel. And if I wanted to go faster still, I could put three computers. And that's what we call multi-core computing, basically split the problem up and run it all in parallel. But it's the parallelism that gives you the power. If, however, you go to a quantum computer, so now you have to imagine, well, I've got a quantum state. So as you make things very, very small, Moore's law goes down to the atomic scale, I'm now entering the world of quantum physics. And what I want to do now is to take information and encode it on not just an atom, but the electron spin or the nuclear spin of an atom. So you can imagine, it's like a little bar magnet. We typically put this at very low temperature, and we put it in a magnetic field. And I can be either aligned with the magnetic field, so I'm at one energy state, or I can be opposite to the of the magnetic field, and I'm in a different energy state. So I have these two different states of energy, spin up or spin down of my little bar magnet. 
And so if I now imagine sitting in the middle of the Earth, if I'm pointing to the North Pole, that would be my digital one of information, so this is my electron spin, and if I'm pointing to the South Pole, that is my digital zero of information. So at the moment, there's no real difference between the two, the classical and the quantum world. However, in the quantum world, I can sit in between those two states. And so I could be pointing to London or Tokyo. And if I now mathematically write down what that is, it's literally just a vector notation. So I'm in some fraction of the down state plus some fraction of the up state. And so it's literally just one equation. It's basically what we now call superposition. In the quantum world, it means I can actually live in between those two states. The key thing about superposition that's useful for quantum computing is that every quantum bit, or a qubit, contains basically two classical bits of information. And so that is different from a transistor which only contains one. The exciting thing, so this is one of the properties that we rely on in quantum computing. The second one is entanglement. So if I now bring my two spins close together, they now behave as one entity. And I can describe that entity by one equation again now. So if you imagine I've got my two spins, they're down, 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 up, up, down, or up, up. And so the interesting thing about this is you can see I've now got four classical bits of information to describe that state. So again, I've doubled the amount of information compared to the classical bit. If I now perform any operations, when you're writing code and you're operating on your actual state, I'm actually operating in all these individual states in parallel. So that's where the parallelism comes from. So the first thing is I'm doubling the amount of information by superposition, and then I'm operating in parallel by doing entanglement. And so the idea is that literally now if I add qubits, I'm doubling the amount of information. So by the time I get to a 30 qubit error corrected system, it is more powerful than a supercomputer. And if I can get to 300 qubits, then it's been predicted to be more powerful than all of the computers in the world connected together. So that is the race, and just to put that in context, you know, a 30 qubit error corrected system would outperform a 60 billion transistor uh, classical computer. And so that's really the difference between the two worlds is this access to potential massively parallel computing. Well, so how is it going to change the world? And I guess one of the things that's interesting for me is that in contrast to classical computing, where when you started at the beginning of that industry, people were making hardware, but they didn't know what to do with it. So some of the first transistors were used for hearing aids or calculators or transistor radios. And with time, they started to figure out what are the algorithms that we can do with our computers until eventually we've got the whole computing industry. In quantum computing, it's very different because we've seen that in the classical computing. We now have a whole bunch of theorists and algorithm experts that have defined these are the applications, these are the algorithms we will run, but the hardware is nowhere near ready for it. And so that's the biggest challenge for this field at the moment is the algorithms are out there, they require lots and lots of qubits, and the hardware is trying to catch up. So let's look at some of the applications that are out there. And these are heavily discussed. <laughs> Wherever I go, there's algorithm groups growing across the world. The big goal, ultimately, is to get an error-corrected quantum computer with many millions of qubits. But that would be like me saying, starting from the first transistor in 1947 and suddenly jumping you know, to 70 years later to having a fully functional computer. That is the journey that we will be going on. But if you look at the algorithms, some of the first ones, the kind of main bodies of algorithms, the first one is optimization. There are companies like UPS in the US that are getting involved in quantum computing because they recognize if they can shorten the distance that their drivers travel just by one mile a day, that they will save their company $50 million a year. So there are lots of optimization problems across pretty much every industry. So whether it's in the transportation industry, whether it's in the finance industry and looking at po portfolio optimization, or in the communications, looking at the spread of the different frequencies that they send their signals out to communicate for communication. They're literally in pretty much every industry that relies on data. The second one is machine learning on big data. So we're obviously getting huge amounts of data coming through. And again, if you can have a quantum state looking in parallel, there's been things about pattern recognition, again, frequency recognition for signals, there's weather forecasting, there's all kinds of algorithms that are predicted out there. I think the one that I'm most excited about is quantum simulation. Um, so basically, at the moment, it's kind of really well understood that if you have more than 20 atoms in any kind of system, physical system, a classical computer just can't work out what the ground state of that system is. There are too many electrons in the system to be able to work out all the interactions between the electrons are. So classical computing really falls down beyond 20 atoms. And so we've already started using quantum systems to try and mimic the classical world. But in the long term, again, it will be looking at things like drug design, how it interacts with the human body, 
looking at nitrogen fertilizer is a really big one that everyone's very excited about because it's a relatively small molecule. But if you can break it up, it will save quite a lot of the heat of the world's energy. It takes about 1% to 2% of the world's energy to break the nitrogen triple bond to make fertilizer. Um, and air aircraft company are also looking at these quantum simulations. And then the big one on the right-hand side is, is the prime factor number, sorry, the prime number factorization. So this was the first Shor's algorithm that came out back in the 1990s, and this is really the thing that would um, break codes. And so that's something that requires a very large error-corrected quantum computer, but you can see now there are about 70 different algorithms that are listed on the US government website, which are algorithms that people are starting to realize are things that are, are real and, prov and provide a provable speed up. So that's the challenge for the field, all those algorithms how do we build the hardware? Well, so one of the other interesting aspects, not only is the technology, which I'm going to get onto very soon, is the way that companies are setting up. So in the original classical computing, there was really only people looking at silicon. It was one material system, everybody competing in that same material system. Um, this is by no means up to date. This is changing pretty much every month at the moment. Um, but just to give you a sense, there are all these different physical platforms that are out there. So you've got superconducting qubits, I know that's done here. Iron traps, you've got silicon, two flavors of silicon, either MOS dots, you can also have silicon germanium or atom qubits, cold atoms opticals, and many others, including Microsoft's and uh, Diamond systems. So it's truly fascinating. There is a huge amount of materials research to be done in making a quantum computer. You, you have the basic fundamental qubit layer itself where you're operating you know, long coherence times, oh sorry, long coherence time system at very rapid speeds to get the information in and off. That's the kind of fundamental base layer. But then on top of that, you've got the full stack, which I'll talk about later. And to build a quantum computer, you need to be able to do all those things together on one physical system. And so if you look at a lot of these, there are areas where you know, things have never been manufactured at scale before. So people get very excited. I heard today about iron trap systems. You're trapping an iron in a vacuum with a laser, and they're now going on chip. But if you try and scale that up, it's never been made at scale before. So the manufacturing really starts to count. And across all of these different physical systems, there are huge challenges in manufacturing. So let's just go now to silicon in a little bit more detail. And this is where the technical part of the talk starts to come in play. In 1998, there were two proposals that came up back to back. David DiVincenzo and Lost, the Lost DiVincenzo proposal, basically said that you could make quantum bits by top-down manufacturing. So basically, you can take any kind of interface between one material and another, where the electron gas sits at the interface between those two different materials sitting here. I've got to remember which one is it, sitting at this interface. And then by putting metal gates on the surface and applying voltages, you could basically deplete the electrons that exist at this interface and create these little quantum dots where you could capture one electron. So this is a top-down technology. You're basically, where you're putting the metal is above where the qubit will sit, and your qubit is sitting at some kind of interface. So you can see you're re already straight away, it's very heavy on the materials. This structure of the gate depends on where the electron sits, and the quality of this interface tells you how good your qubit's going to be. On the right-hand side was the idea of using atoms in silicon. And the idea originally here is to put phosphorus atoms into silicon, where phosphorus has one extra nuclear spin and one extra electron spin. And you can use either the nuclear or the electron, or both, to encode information. The original plan was to have gates, again, sitting above some kind of dielectric. And that way, you could control the information on and off these, these qubit states. If we actually now look at some of the practical devices that are being made in this space, this is a two qubit system that's being made in Sydney. Here, the two qubits are sitting beneath the device, and these are all the metal gates that sit above to control where the electrons move. And you can see for this two qubit system, you've got roughly about 14 different gates sitting there that you need to control where the electron forms and how you can pass information in and off it. On the right-hand side is what we're kind of making in the bottom-up approach. So we're putting the phosphorus atoms into the crystal. But what we're doing is where these bright regions are, these are where phosphorus atoms are, and the rest of it's silicon, and then we encapsulate with silicon. And so some of the key differences you can see here is the precision that you get with the scanning tunneling microscope. But it also shows you the low density that you have. So where you put the phosphorus atoms, you trap the electrons, and you can not only create the qubits at these D1, 2, do states, but you can also create these metallic gates to control the information. So it's a fully epitaxial crystal structure where there are no interfaces and no defect states nearby. And the advantage of this system is you should have faster speeds, higher fidelities, smaller size, and greater reproducibility. So for me, it is the Swiss watch of quantum computing. 
So let's just look a little bit more detail what the original proposal was. Again, we've got these phosphorus atoms with the electron spin. If you want to encode information on, say, the nuclear spin of the phosphorus atom, you can put it in a magnetic field, as I mentioned before, at low temperature, and you have your basically spin up and spin down states. You can address each of the different nuclei by changing voltages on this gate, which basically changes the electron and, uh, and nuclear spin overlap, and that changes the frequency at which you address each individual qubit. Alternatively, you can put a voltage on this J gate, and you can get the two electrons to overlap, so you can entangle the two nuclear spins. So by just using voltages on gates in a magnetic field at low temperature, you have full control of where the electron sits on that sphere that I showed you earlier. And so the advantages of this system is you have these very long coherence times. So we're talking 35 seconds for the nuclear spin and roughly a second for the electron spin. And if we compare that to, say, superconducting qubits, you're looking at microseconds to milliseconds at best. So that gives you an idea of why pursuing this in silicon has an advantage. You've already got the manufacturability, but now you've got the long coherence times. The other advantage is you can make them very close together, so you can get them to be very, very fast. And one of the key things that I kind of look at it is the, for those that know what iron traps are with the irons trapped in a vacuum, so they're surrounded by nothing, so nothing causes them to lose their quantum state. In silicon, you can put it in silicon 28, and that's like a vacuum, it's called the semiconductor vacuum. So it's about as clean a system as you're going to get in a solid state system that you can actually hold and manufacture. And as I show you, you get this very low noise system because it's all epitaxial. Now, the challenge, obviously, is how do you put atoms that are that far apart? How can you actually put them there and then get information in and off? And certainly when this was proposed back in the 1990s, the common view was there's just no way that humans know how to put an atom into a crystal, let alone put information on it and read it out again. So that was really the kind of challenge that we had for the last 20 years. So I'll flip back to history. So I've talked about Moore and how influential Gordon Moore was. Another person that's highly influential is um, Richard Feynman. And so Richard Feynman, again, go back to the 1950s. 1950s, he already, without having seen an atom, there was no scanning tunneling microscope in his day, he believed that you know, in the great future, we should have the ability to manipulate atoms and put them where we want. And in fact, he kind of said, why must we always accept what nature gives us? Why can't we put them where we want? We, you know, we, sh we should have the ability to do that. There's nothing in the principles of physics that he could see that would speak against the ability to achieve that. Now, I saw this lecture when I was undergraduate, and I thought it was great. And I saw it only a few years ago, having now lived the journey that I've lived. And I think it's quite telling for me that a lot of the things that he predicted we have now done. So it's quite exciting for me to go back and look at that. So first of all, how do you put atoms where you want? And so the scanning tunneling microscope was invented in the 1980s. It is essentially a very fine metal tip that comes down to the surface of your surface, whatever it is, so in silicon atoms. Um, when you get very, very close, this is under vacuum, so you can see this is an ultra-high vacuum chamber, so it's typically 10 to minus 11. When you get down to the very close to the surface, a current will flow under applied voltage between the tip surface and the atoms on the surface. That's your tunneling current. It's tunneling from the tip through the vacuum to the surface of the atom. You then maintain that current constant, and you literally drag the atom using piezo actuators across the surface, and it traces out the heights of the atoms on the surface. And if you raster scan that, then you build up essentially a topographic image of what the atoms on the surface look like. So that was, again, within four years of discovering the scanning tunneling microscope from IBM, they won the Nobel Prize for it because it was such a transformational technology that really proved that atoms existed. Then shortly after that, IBM went a step further, and they came up with this very creative way of saying, if we apply voltage to this tip, it acts like a little electrostatic attractor. The atoms on the surface, if they're metal atoms, will pick, go up to the tip, I'll move them around, and I'll put them down somewhere else by pulsing the voltage. And they formed the world's smallest logo, IBM, uh, using metal atoms on a metal surface. So that was very exciting, because it was the first time that we had this idea we might be able to make things with that kind of precision. The challenge with semiconductors, though, is that the bonds are very, very strong. So they're very strongly covalently bonded. You can't just pick a phosphorus or a silicon atom up, move it around, and put, put it where you want it. So what we did in Australia was we came up with an idea that literally mimicked a clean room process that you would find in Intel. So we started out knowing that you can only see the device when it's in the microscope. Once you take it out, the piece of silicon with all my beautiful atomic scale transistors in there looks exactly the same as if nothing was there. So the first thing we have to do is to make some kind of registration marker on the surface. Um, we etch this down. We use electron beam lithography to create these typically. 
um, now, um, and you etch it down and that forms a little marker. We then load that wafer into the vacuum system and we heat it up and then we cool it down. So we, in order to get an, a, what we call a reconstructed surface where we can see the atoms on the surface, you heat it up to about 1,000 degrees and cool it down. Then once it's cool, we then put atomic hydrogen into the system. So the silicon atoms at the top, they've got dangling bottoms, they've lo dangling bonds, they've lost the atoms above them, so they will grab a hydrogen atom and it will passivate the whole surface. And that acts as an atomic scale mask. We then come along with our STM tip and we dissolve hydrogen in certain regions, exposing the silicon underneath. And so now, when we bring our phosphorus atom in, we use phosphine gas, and the phosphine will stick where the exposed silicon is and it will bounce off the hydrogen terminated surface around it. What is really nice about this process is for a phosphorus atom to be incorporated into silicon, we actually do an anneal step after this, it will only go in if there's a big enough hole. If the hole's too small, it won't be able to go in, and I'll show you why in a few slides. So then when we heat the surface up, the phosphorus goes into the top layer of the silicon and it kicks the silicon out. You can actually see the ejected silicon sitting on the surface, and now it's embedded in the crystal so that when we come along, we can grow with molecular beam epitaxy at low temperature. We can encapsulate the whole surface. The phosphorus is now locked in place. It doesn't come to the surface. We can actually go back and image it beneath the surface, and we've got some beautiful images of what that looks like. And then basically, using these registration markers, we take it out of the vacuum system and we make contact to the buried device. Now, this is a very simple process. It did take us about five or six years to implement this process, but we've been doing this now for more than 15 years. So it now has an incredibly high yield. We have a no downtime policy, and we have about a 99% yield of getting devices through. In making a whole, so now we're making the whole computer in the silicon chip. And so we can pattern these large regions, which can act as sensors. We can pattern wires, or we can bring down single phosphorus atoms. So we can literally, just by changing the dimensions of the lithographic regions, we can make the whole circuit. We can make capacitors, we can make amplifiers, all in the silicon chip. So let's go back to Feynman. He said at that point, 1959, why can't we make tiny little wires of, say, 10 or 100 angstroms in diameter? So we did that. So we literally wanted to figure out how thin can we make this wire and it still bring a signal down to our qubits. And so we went down here, if you look at the lithography, it's two dimer rows wide, so that's four atoms wide. We dose with phosphine, it will only absorb along these regions here. And because phosphine's a tiny molecule, it will crowd into these wires down here. So that when you encapsulate it, the distance between the phosphorus atoms is less than the Bohr radius of where the probability density of the electrons sits in the phosphorus atoms. So what's amazing about this is these wires essentially are metallic. They actually have the same resistivity as copper. And so if we look at the resistivity as a function of the diameter, we find that we could go all the way down to the atomic scale and keep this very low resistivity. Whereas most wires the industry was looking at would become resistive once you went below about 10 nanometers. So that this is very profound. It basically was you know, unexpected at the time. We didn't know this was going to happen. But it basically means that we can make these wires and we can bring them into our circuits. And because the resistivity is low, we can put gigahertz frequencies down these wires so that we can actually rotate the qubit around the block sphere. So the next thing we wanted to do, imagine these wires are phosphorus in silicon. And so the electrons are traveling through heavily, like a pathway of phosphorus atoms. They're trying to get from one side of the device to the other. And the phosphorus has got that little sharp Coulomb potential that sits in the crystal. So you could imagine you've got these little sharp potentials and the electrons kind of hopping through to get through the wire. But what actually happens is because we've got these, such a high density of phosphorus, that all the electrons fill up all those trap states so that it can get through the wire very, very quickly. And so what we wanted to do is figure out if we made this wire thinner and thinner and thinner, could eventually we break it up into puddles? So these are gates on either side that allow us to deplete the wire. If the wire is very thin, we get this behavior. And if we go above about four nanometers, we sit what we call above the conductance of quantum states, highly conducting. Electrons just sit through without getting trapped. On this wire, though, you can start to see you get these oscillations. And this is where literally the electrons are hopping through the wire as you break it into puddles. Now, this would be, you know, in the worst case scenario, this could be bad for our qubits because we're passing information through the actual crystal itself. And so what we tried to do is measure the noise in these three different regions. And you can see when we're sitting above the conductance, we get this very low noise. If we're sitting here, we get these sharp signals. So this is the signal that we've got electrons hopping back and forth. Despite that, we can do what we call a measurement of how bad that noise is. We measure something called the huge parameter. And the lower this parameter, the lower the noise system. 
And what's amazing about this is you can see here we've got carbon nanotubes, which are considered the perfect conductors. They're just literally sheaves of conducting. Every atom is formed in these lovely nanotubes. And what's, what we find is that our wires are sitting really low down here. So they're a very low noise system. So if we're making a whole circuit where these wires come into our qubit states to pulse information in and out of, then having these wires at very low noise is very important for us. We've since gone on to show that if we make a whole kind of qubit architecture, so we've got our two qubits here, our wires around it is encapsulated with silicon, and we've got a native oxide when we take it out of the chamber. We actually found that the noise is, can be measured by this transistor, or it can be measured on the qubits. And over this kind of eight orders, or four orders of magnitude frequency range, again, we get the lowest noise that exists in a solid state system. So step back, what does all that mean? It basically means by putting phosphorus atoms in silicon, it's a crystalline structure. There are no interfaces nearby. That means that the environment our qubit sits in is about as perfect as you can make it. So it's very important as we scale the qubits. OK, so then Feynman asks, you know, what happens if you put seven atoms together? You'll get something that's completely different in the way it behaves to a kind of classical transistor. So we started out not going straight for seven atoms. We wanted to see if we could make a single atom transistor. So we open up this hole, and I mentioned before, it has to be big enough that when the phosphine comes in, the phosphine will land. These are three silicon dimer rows, and it will dissociate to eventually it will incorporate into the surface and it will kick a silicon out. So this chemical reaction has to be allowed to occur for the phosphorus to go in. So just by changing the size of the holes in the resist, we can engineer single atoms, we can engineer any number of atoms that we want. In order to prove that this is a phosphorus atom, the great thing about the quantum world is you'll get some kind of signature, some kind of spectroscopic signature. And what we do is we measure this directly in the device. So here's our single phosphorus atom. We will basically pass a current through that phosphorus atom and change the voltage on here to change the energy levels of that phosphorus atom. And when we do that, we should be able to see a signature that says that that is a phosphorus atom and nothing else. So here's our Coulomb potential. Optically, it was measured to show the energy level differences between loading one electron and loading two electrons, and then eventually going to the conduction bands that basically just getting current going straight through. And so we can measure, as a function of these biases, what these different signatures give us. And if we then change what we call the source drain bias, we get this beautiful fingerprint of what the atom is in the middle. And by measuring this energy level here and knowing the number of transitions, we can definitively prove that it's a phosphorus atom by measuring this energy. If I had an antimony atom or any other kind of atom here, this would be different and the number of transitions would be different. So what we're now doing is we're really, for the first time, controlling the atomic world. We're really getting down and measuring directly the quantum energy levels of atoms that we're putting in where we want to put them in. Now, I have thousands of slides of different devices where we will put different numbers of phosphorus atoms in, or we'll have different kinds of atoms, and they all have their own electronic signature. And what's interesting about this is when you're building a quantum computer, you have to understand how every atom impacts where the qubit state exists. We, call it, we have a motto in our company, every atom counts. And so my personal view is that you cannot build a quantum computer without this kind of level knowledge, because it completely changes the operation of the system. OK, we also will image what the wave function of an in individual electron looks like on an individual phosphorus atom. And so in, in contrast to the kind of fuzzy ball that you imagine or some kind of Gaussian decay, the phosphorus electron, the electron sitting on the phosphorus atom, interacts with the bonds of the crystal. And so that also changes the energy level of the qubit state itself. So these microscopic details really, really matter. Anyway, just for fun, we opened up a bigger hole. We deliberately put seven phosphorus atoms in there. If you look at this now, you can see this is a signature of seven phosphorus atoms in there, seven different transitions as electrons coming off. And you see the size of these diamonds change. So again, it's exquisitely sensitive to the number of electrons and the number of atoms on the system. And what's also interesting is you find out these structures here tell you about what states are coming in the lead state, so one-dimensional, and your phosphorus atoms sitting in the middle. OK, so then he asks, you know, we can make circuits. We're looking at the quantized energy levels of interacting spins. And just to give you a very brief overview, we've spent the last 25 years looking at this technology. The first kind of 10 years were, can we put atoms in place? Can we make functional devices and know where the atoms are? Then we started looking at a single atom, measuring a single spin, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, looking at how we're going to build a full-scale architecture for a quantum computer, and then independently measuring phosphorus atoms that are very, very close together. 
And then since we've set up the company in 2017, we've been able to turbocharge this whole field. So we now have roughly between 50 and 60 engineers in the company, and we're literally trying to build the whole circuit, the whole computer in-house. And so that means we have to worry about the speed of our operations. We want to get information in and off the qubit as fast as we can. So at the moment, we're holding the record for microsecond readout. We're moving to nanosecond readout, which is the fastest in semiconductors. We've got the fastest two-qubit gate, which I'll describe in a few seconds, the lowest charge noise. We're literally looking at all the metrics. And because we've got that precision, we can really start to engineer the best of the devices. So now I'm just going to, at the last part of the lecture, I'm just going to go through essentially four results that give you a sense of what kind of thing we can do. And it really gives you a sense of the power and the importance of understanding the precision that you need. So the first one is, how do you measure the spin of an individual electron sitting on an individual atom? In order to do this, we use this device, which is the single electron transistor. You're measuring current through something, which you bring very, very close to your qubit states. And this acts as a charge sensor. So it's close enough so that if electrons move in here, we'll be able to detect it in the current that we're passing through this sensor. Now, the amazing thing about this, and this is really, I guess, more for some of the quantum computing pe people in the audience, is there are many things that you need to get right. If you talk about scaling up qubits, everyone worries about crosstalk. So if you put a voltage on one gate, is it going to affect the qubit you want, or is it going to affect the qubit that's you know, four, four lines down? And so you need to minimize crosstalk, because you're literally getting these qubits to rotate around a block sphere. And each one is rotating around a block sphere and being entangled. And so any voltages from three or four gates away affecting your qubit is going to knock it out of the original um, intended state that you want it to be in. And so one of the things I like about this, I've already talked about the high density and the fast gigahertz speeds, but the, the wires are literally one monolayer thick in the vertical direction. And so if you look at it, it, the actual capacitance between this wire and another wire sitting on the same surface is really small because it's only one monolayer thick. And so the crosstalk in these devices is much less. And that's a big, big benefit for us. It also, you have this very high um, uh, conductance. That means you can get these high frequencies through. You can also then bring your qubits very close to your sensor. And so the closer you are, as long as you can maintain them as independent entities, you can actually sense an electron moving. So you can get very high on-off um, ratios, so very high fidelity control of your qubits. If you engineer the size of this sensor, you can make it so that the current when the electron's in one state is very high, and when the electron moves, it can go to zero. So you can engineer what we call an on-off ratio. Um, and then finally, you basically have this very tight potential. So you can actually have a sensor that basically goes from a very high level of conductance to a very low level. All of that comes about from the engineering. So what we're going to do now is we bring our sensor close. We're going to measure the current that comes through here as a function of these two gate biases. And when the chemical potential of this aligns with the island, an electron will move if it's in a certain spin state. We put it in a magnetic field, so spin up is one energy level, spin down is another energy level. And so here we see the conductance through the device. These lines are the SET conductance, and these bright regions are where an electron moves from our sensor to our qubit state. We zoom in on one of these transition points, and here we see our two energy levels, spin up and spin down of the donor, and the energy level of the sensor. The first thing that we do is we pulse these down so the electron will load onto our qubit state, so we know it's spin on. We come off the um, conductance SET, so we go down to zero here. We then straddle these two spin states either side of the SET, and if it's in the spin up state, it will move across, and an electron will move back, and we get this beautiful sharp peak showing this is a spin up electron. We then move it to the point where we pulse these up, we get rid of the electron, Ooh, we go back onto the SET conductance, and the peak comes back up. So all we're doing is we're pulsing voltages on the gates and moving the energy levels of our sensor with respect to the donor. And we can measure with high fidelity whether we've got a spin-up state or a spin-down state. So it's just voltage pulsing in a magnetic field. Very briefly go through this. So basically, the four results we've had recently, we've got that down to microsecond time frames. We actually have a whole benchmarking paper about how you can get up above 99%. We found that we can get rid of the leads and have just a one-lead state that can measure with high fidelity up to 15 qubits. Most qubit systems in solid state are only three. And then by changing the way that we operate the system, so not just the design of the actual qubit estate, but just by ramping instead of pulsing to one energy level, but ramping through, we can actually get above 99.95% fidelity. So these numbers are really the, the best in the field at the moment. And that all comes about from that beautiful understanding of engineering it. 
Okay, so now we've got three more results to go. So the next one is the two qubit gate. So we want to literally take information where we load a cube electron on one qubit state, we load an electron on the other qubit state, they're sitting about 10 nanometers apart, so we can be able to do that independently and read them out. And then when we bring them close enough together, we start to see them oscillate. And this is the exchange, this is the entanglement that we get from having the two qubits acting as one entity. So here's our device, we've got our two qubits here, we've got the readout sensor, we look at these two transition lines so we can measure both the left and the right dots independently, even though they're very, very close together. So we know whether it's down, down, up, down, down, up, or up, up. And now we load these two states together so we have a spin up on one, spin down on the other, bring them close together, and we see these oscillations here in the exchange. And what this means is in 0.8 nanoseconds, we can swap the electron from being down on this state to up on this state. So that's one of the operations, it's one of the key operations you have in, in, fun in a functional quantum computer, and the fact we can do that very fast is very um, uh, compelling for scale-up. The next result I want to talk about is this quantum analog simulation. And so what we're now trying to do, and this is again what Feynman said, if you make devices with sub-nanometer precision, you can actually start to mimic nature. Most of the physical systems that are out there that are trying to do quantum simulation are much physically bigger. So here you can see the distances are 0.1 micron, 5 to 10 micron, 1 micron. So they're too far away to actually mimic a molecule in the way that you can if you have this kind of precision down at 5 nanometers. So the molecule we chose was polyacetylene, which is essentially a carbon-carbon double bond followed by a single bond, all in a chain. And so what this means is that this bond length is shorter than this bond length. And so what we did was we made devices now where we basically create the double bond, a single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond. And then we put gates around it and we try and measure the conductance through this device. Now, theoretically, we deliberately chose a 10-dot device because we know that classical computers can simulate that system. And so we made essentially two sets of devices. One where we cut through the single bond, so we end up with a double bond at the end of the chain and the other one where we cut through a double bond and we end up with a single bond at the end of the chain. Now, classically, we can mimic, or we can measure what we would expect for those two systems. And just to give you a sense, you're looking here at sub-nanometer precision differences between the two. Classically, you would expect what we call the trivial states up here, so every time you add an electron, they hop through the chain and they come off the other side, and so if you cut through here, you would expect to get 10 peaks in the current. And so what you see here is the measured device and then the modeling sitting on top, if we look at this device now, you're sitting with these uh, phosphorus atoms sitting at the end. And so what happens when the electrons come through this chain, they come into this one and they fill the first four values, so nothing happens, no change in the conductance happens, they fill these states, because these are too far away, it can't get off once it's in. Then when you get to the fifth state, an electron will come here and it will go right across to this one and out. So it's coherently transferring across the chain. And so what we expect now, if we cut through, is basically a double peak in the middle and then a big gap for the next conductance peak as you fill the four electrons in here. So what is amazing about this, it's the first time that we've really been able to have that precision to mimic nature just by putting our phosphorus atoms with that sub-nanometer precision. There's three things we had to do to get this working. One was that precision and where we put the atoms. The second one was choosing the right size of these. And the third one was to have these gates around it to allow us to change the potential of each of the dots so the electrons can get through. This is very exciting for us, but it also signifies the point at which we step off the edge of the world, because now every device we make, and we can make easily thousands of phosphorus dots, cannot be simulated classically. So there is nowhere to verify what it is we're expecting. And that's quite a scary thought, because you're making devices that are showing something, but you don't know what the hell it is that's showing, and there's no way to classically simulate it. Okay, so the last one is just to give you a sense of where we're going, and this is just a few slides about you know, scale-up. In order to do error correction, this is something most of you have heard about, all, all quantum computing companies at the moment, none of them have demonstrated error correction. So just to put that in context, a classical computer runs multiple calculations in parallel, and it looks at the majority answer, and that happens all the time, we don't even know about it, but our computers would not work if that didn't happen. So of those 60 billion transistors, not all of them are going to work. There's going to be errors, and classical computing runs error correction. Quantum computing has to do the same thing. And the difference now is it's much more sensitive. You've got the phase. Basically, it's not just one or zero, but you've got all those states in between. So it's much more sensitive to errors. And as a consequence, there are these error correction codes where you will basically add 
phosphorus atoms or qubits around your major data qubit, and they detect the errors, and then they correct the error on your qubit. And so every qubit will have a number of what we call ancilla qubits that protect it from errors and allow it to keep its state. Anyway, that qubit is called a logical qubit. No one yet in the world has made a logical qubit that is scalable for a practical quantum computer. So that is the next big thing that all companies are heading for. And in order to do that, you really need to have um, your kind of data qubit with these qubits around that allow you to correct for x, z, and theta errors. If you look at that, the pattern at which they form, because you have to be able to address them synchronously and in parallel, means there's only certain patterns that you can make of error-corrected qubit architectures. And they're typically in this two-dimensional array. If you have a two-dimensional array, you've got to get information in and out of this middle qubit, but you've got to get wires into it. So it's very hard to imagine how you're going to get all those wires in to connect to the qubit. And so this is, again, an area we're very excited by, because you can make these three-dimensional patterns. We can pattern on one plane with wires going one way, grow silicon, pattern our qubits on the next plane with our sensors, grow more silicon, and then pattern wires on the top plane that run perpendicular to the, the wires in the bottom plane. So those are the kind of three-dimensional architectures that we're pursuing at the moment. In our middle plane, we actually now have 1,024 qubits with our sensors. So we figured out how to make that really precise, how to have the accuracy to get the wires above and below so we can get the information in. And we've basically shown that we can control the growth. So those that do MBE in the audience, the growth is that you've got to keep it nice and flat so you can pattern with atomic precision on multiple planes. So here you see basically the second plane, the growth has already filled the first plane, we're now patterning on the second plane. And we've been able to show that actually the irony is by patterning in multiple planes, you have phosphorus atoms that sit between your qubit layer and your surface layer, which is where the noise comes from in our devices, and you get even better qubits than if you had just a, a single plane of qubits. So that's something we're very excited by. So just to now kind of wrap up in a few slides, we now can really beautifully visualize where our qubits are. We've figured out how to pattern incredibly quickly and with high yields. So we've got a very great manufacturing process, and we're now putting information off individual atoms and electron spins on atoms with exquisite precision. What I've shown you today is relatively high level, believe it or not. I had a lot more slides that I've taken out about how we're controlling multi-qubit systems and literally the kind of pulse sequences that you need to control that. If you want to build a quantum computer, though, that is just everything I've described to you today is just bottom chip. That is just the beginning of the whole journey. And the journey that I'm on now that I'm particularly excited about is what we call punching through the stack. And so there are at least eight different layers. There's actually many more if you break these down. But basically, you've got these kind of qubit layer with your qubit sitting in there, which is this layer. You've then got kind of a readout multiplexing chip. So you want to get lots and lots of signals onto your chip at certain frequencies. That is a completely separate technology that has to sit cryogenically next to your chip. Then above that, you've got basically um, FPGA processing. So you've got to get signals on and off very, very quickly. Uh, you've got control and readout layers and error correction and algorithms and applications. And then you put it on the cloud so people can play with it. So that is a whole journey. It's, at least, uh, it's taken me at least five years to build through that stack. And that's something that we're um, doing right at the moment. And so the kind of last question, how long is it going to take? Everybody asks me this, so I always have this slide ready. I like to compare it to classical computing. The invention of the transistor, 1947. The first integrated circuit, 1958. The first kind of commercial device is 1964, and then the first industrial computer in 1971. That is our roadmap. That is what we're using as a guide for us. So our first single atom transistor was 2012. We got our first integrated circuit, 2021. We're now looking for our first useful, commercially useful device. That is very exciting. Um, and then we're looking at the error corrective system in 2033. Now that is, honestly, that is an ambitious roadmap. I have seen many other people putting that at least five years after, and I've seen some companies talking about it in the next three years. Um, but it's a super exciting journey. Hopefully I've given you some sense of it, and I'm very happy to take questions, so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Michelle. Now we're going to do an experiment. I'm going to entangle the questions in the panel with the questions in the public. I've never done this before, so let's see if it works. So uh, we've got now a very dense presentation. Thank you so much. It's been uh, very exciting to see all this progress, especially now that I think you're going to an exponential growth uh, in uh, knowledge creation. So I'd like to zoom a bit out. Mm -hmm. and uh, just 
look from the start of your career and, and let me know, uh, let me know uh, so can you tell us how do you guide your career? When did you know that you were right? And how do you create the vision? Because 20 years after, it's very easy, but how yeah. did you know you were going to go this path? Yeah, look, I, I don't think I ever really knew where I was going. Um, so during my early phase of my career, I knew very quickly that I liked making things, and I particularly liked um, picking up different skill sets. And so I, I never liked the idea, which um, a lot of research teams can get into the trap of, of segmenting the research so that certain people do different things. And so earlier in my career, in my solar cells, I realized that I wanted to make devices. And so I started from right at the beginning, the crystal growth. Actually, I started with, the, I actually grew the wafers, the balls, then sliced them up, polished them, then grew with MOCVD, um, and then actually measured the devices and then sat with the theorists about understanding it. And I suddenly realized, wow, I can do all of this. And it was just such a... Uh, I don't know, highly rewarding, demanding, because it takes a lot of time, but very rewarding. And then from that time, I realized I was making solar cells, but they were, uh, for me, not the kind of career path I wanted. I realized that they were not, um, they were actually quite toxic, making them in the, the technique that we were using. We had to wear full face masks, because we were using cadmium sulfide, cadmium tellurite. Um, and so I wanted to make something that was going to be fundamentally useful, but it was challenging. And then I moved um, to the Cavendish, and there it was very fundamental quantum physics. And so I loved that. I looked, worked in lots of different groups. Again, the hierarchy of the different, you know, you're either a crystal grower or an EBL person. I found that very challenging, so I tried to pick up all the skills of doing everything. Um, and then at that point, I realized quantum computing was just coming out. And so I, I never, you know, A, I never thought I would be a professor at university. B, I never thought I'd be a director of a center. C, I never thought I'd set a company. So at each stage, I was just literally pursuing what was the most interesting and rewarding for me. Thank you. So now, uh, in this entanglement experiment, I'd like to present you the members of the, of the debate panel. And uh, anytime you have a question, so I, let us talk about 20 minutes, and after that, I will look here. So if you have a question, you just go here, and there's going to be a microphone, so then I will ask you the question. So I will try to coordinate the two. Um, so the first member of, of, of the panel, uh, Parisa Falahi, she is a co-founder and CEO of Basel Precision Instruments. She has a bachelor from Imperial College and a PhD from Harvard University. She knows well the Swiss uh, research scene because she was working as a researcher for a long time at ETH Zurich. Uh, Jean-Philippe Brantu, uh, associate professor in physics at EPFL and a PhD from Institut d'Optique under the direction of Philippe uh, Bouillet and Alain Aspect, Nobel Prize and physics, and she also knows very well ETH Zurich. He was a postdoc there for some time. So uh, I will ask you now this question. Uh, maybe, uh, Parisa, you want to say something about your path and how you have been a very interesting path from research to uh, starting a company. So maybe tell us how you did it. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you very much for the um, invitation to be here. It's a, an absolute pleasure, and it was a very, very nice talk, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, I started in uh, my PhD in 1999, so it was just at the beginning of, uh, well, at the beginning of, at, at early days of, uh, of making uh, single electron transistors and so on. I made a single electron quantum dot for my PhD and imaged it, so that was, um, um, that's where I started this field, and I was in research for a while. Um, and then um, at some point I left academia, which was considered not a very wise decision from many, for, from the perspective of many people. Uh, I started working in a company and then sort of at some point founded my own company and came a little bit back, if you like, into the field of quantum. So that's the journey. Um, I would like to um, maybe answer the question a little bit more generally. I think that um, what is important is to find what gives you joy. And this is very general, but to find the thing that you like, and this is exactly what Michelle said, that you, you find out what it is that makes you happy and what it is that you really like, and then try to be as non-judgmental as possible about it and trust it and go with it and find, give yourself freedom to do it. So I think we get a lot of, um, we get a lot of messages, especially at women, from the society, from, the, from academia, from outside academia, about what is success and what we should do. And if you can try to, the more one can separate oneself from that and really listen to what really gives you that excitement. I think that is what is going to keep 
that is the real signal of are you on the right path or not. So that was my thank very you. general answer. Thank you. Thank you. Jean-Philippe? Um, so, um, well, I mean, um, I sort of got interested to quantum physics from the beginning, from the fundamental point of view, and I'm, of course, now very um, humble looking at your presentation. I got stuck to the fundamental <laughs> um, and pretty much stayed there. Um, and I think for me, um, yeah, it was more, of course, just um, following sort of a natural path, just driven by curiosity, driven by essentially what, what would you like to do next, and sort of never think that things are not possible until you've tried. And if you try enough, sometimes um, things you, that were told to be too hard or that nobody even dared to try just turned out to be actually possible. So I think it's, uh, mm. that's how I would see. But, uh, Exciting times. So, Michelle, you're very convinced about your technology, but we hear a lot of other technologies, um, many companies that are very sure they're going to make it, they're going to dominate the world with the quantum algorithms, with uh, other technologies. Do you want to give us a kind of an overview of what exists and what the different advantages are? Uh, oh, gosh, that's tough. That's tough because there's so many. Overview for general yeah. public. Yeah, mm. so look, I think... Um, the, the way I kind of look at it is, as I said in the talk, when, when it became popular, a lot of people adapted what they were doing. And so if you look at superconducting qubits, the, the size of the qubits are actually very big, so they're microns inside, they're very big systems. And as a consequence, they tend to interact a lot with their environment, and that means their coherence times are short. And so, you know, nothing in life is free. You end up with a system that you can manufacture very quickly. You don't have to develop manufacturing. Um, but then you've got these materials issues which you have to fight against. And I think for me, looking across the quantum computing field, every system has different issues. And no one, honestly, no one knows until you've actually built something that works which one is going to work the best. Uh, I do think you have to be passionate about the system that you're looking at, though, because there are just so many challenges that if you don't believe in it, then you would probably stop. Um, and so I think for me, the fact that we have um, people that are convinced in their own technology is actually a positive because it means that they're committed to their technology. And I think you need, you need that commitment to be able to see it through. And fundamentally, I think a lot of people are driven by that curiosity. Is it going to work? I mean, I'm driven by, can it work? I mean, I never, I never imagined when we started the journey that we would make devices in the way we're making now. So they've surpassed my expectations. Um, and so now the fact that it has surpassed it and there's been things that we didn't anticipate that have been given to us for free, like the wires working so well, um, then for me it's just like, how far can we go? You know, what's going to stop us? And that's, yeah, it's pretty, there's never a dull, <laughs> never a dull day. <laughs> and how do you see the role of the private sector? So companies, how, what do you, how do you see the role that they're playing in this evolution? Yeah, look, this is fascinating. I mean, I, so I, I've tried to read a little bit about the silicon industry at the beginning and how it evolved, and it was very competitive, and, um, but it really was centered around one material, whereas the quantum is just so fascinating. You've got the big you know, global corporates, the Googles, Microsofts, and IBM. Um, a few of those at least are software companies, so they're coming from a software background, um, and certainly my experience working with John Martinez from Google was that you know, he built, you know, he was a hardware person that was bought by Google, and they tried to build their system, and they got supremacy, it was very exciting. Um, but then he, he described how the software guys kind of took over, and they said to him, you know, we can just keep making it better by running software, you know, we don't really need your qubits anymore, we can just take what we've got. And he was like, no, 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 the qubits are not good enough yet, you know, there's still need, more needs to be done. And, and so for me, it's just it's utterly fascinating that you can have a big global software company try and absorb an academic hardware group and then kind of mold it into something. And so Google's on its own journey now. And likewise, Microsoft, you know, looked at, you know, a Fields Medalist came up with the idea of making Majoranas and they're very, you know, theoretically beautiful, but very practically dif difficult to, to make, yeah? So for me, looking at the approaches, and then you've got, you know, companies like ours, which are coming out from academia, and a lot of people will say to us, you know, fat chance you've got of competing with these big global corporates. But then I, you know, I don't believe in that. I believe that you, know, you, you, you need a combination of things. You need the tenacity to do it. You need the physical system. You need to be able to build teams. Uh, you need to keep it real. You know? So a lot of people will know about hype in quantum computing where you, know, you hear about stories all the time about what they can do and how many qubits and everything else. But fundamentally, either nature's going to let us have it or it's not. 
And so it's really, it's a battle with nature, not with the companies for me. I see. You still need the means. You still, yeah, you still need money, that's true. <laughs> but even, even that's interesting, because if you look at that, again, a lot of people will say, you can't have a startup because you need you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions. And it's true, the entry level is high. Um, but then, you know, if you don't use a foundry, if you're using a foundry and you're relying on a foundry, it's a very expensive process. But if you're coming up with a new way of manufacturing, I think you can get away without needing the hundreds and hundreds of millions. So, but time will tell. Yeah, looking forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I still have some questions, but if people want to start lining up it with questions here, uh, I'll be happy to see, to give you the, the mic. So, um, we, we, journals talk a lot about quantum computing, but uh, there's many more applications in quantum, and um, do you want to highlight some of them? Um, John Philip, for example? Yes, I mean, so, um, as, you, as you said, that you know, there is quantum, hardcore quantum computing, but you also highlighted, for example, quantum simulation and something which is really delivered already in what you actually showed. Um, there's also much more practical advantages for some sensing and so on um, for applications which could already be thought as uh, almost industrial. Um, there's one thing which I may perhaps, um, there's also sort of a question for you maybe. Um, one advantage, I mean you talked about the quantum advantages sort of being able to do computation um, that cannot be done by classical means. There might be also, an ad may there be also an advantage in doing uh, computation, for example, which consume much less energy, uh, because one of the main problem you have in scaling down uh, actual classical computers is that at some point you need to get the heat out, you need to power them with energy, and uh, sort of, is there a room for quantum application in that area, which is perhaps not as uh, crazy as, you know, cracking uh, RSA codes or things like this, but that might actually have some transformational impact, I and mean, what, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, look, I, I don't know. So, I, so one of the frustrations for me is there are so many different applications in the quantum space. Um, and I guess we're focused very much on the computational aspects and what we need for that. Um, but I'm looking all the time at, at algorithm developers about what are the other things that we can do outside of that space. And so energy, you know, there's, a, there's a huge growing momentum in people looking at energy at the moment, but I don't have enough knowledge to know whether it's going to work or not. I don't know, do, you, do either of you? No. No, I, I also don't know. <laughs> uh, but I also, um, another thing that I was thinking about is that the, we probably will not go from not having quantum computing to having quantum yeah. computing, right? It will come slowly and it will come in, in, maybe we will have a small quantum processor that we would have to then link with, a, with our existing yeah. um, classical computing. So that would also, I think the journey of how this will move also will determine a little bit what applications will then be addressed first. Um, and I also think that it will be driven a lot by the market. So people are going to be thinking about it and then coming up with, you know, where the money then goes, where the demand is, is probably also going to have a large effect on where we go with it. But it's um, very, very difficult also to know um, mm -hmm. what, what, what it will really do. <laughs> Thank you. We have the first question from the public. Hello. Uh, yep. So my question is about sort of other groups that are building quantum platforms on silicon talk about the advantage of silicon being that there's already all these foundries and companies that work on making these big chips in silicon, but you're using a different manufacturing process. Have you thought much about how you're going to scale this to eventually build super like large Systems? Uh, oh, absolutely. So I think the the approach that we're taking is the core of it is based on the manufacturing. And so, you know, if you look at the gate density for our system, it's incredibly low. So we're literally one, one to two gates per qubit. If you look at the kind of foundry-based qubits, you need a lot more gates to create the confinement to capture the electrons. And so at the moment, I kind of liken the foundry approach to being quite blunt and it uses a, a lot of materials from the periodic table to create the confinement for the qubits and the different isolation layers. So I think they've got inherent problems with their manufacturing. Even though they can stamp out millions, they've got problems at the core of changing the coherence times and the speeds and the crosstalk. So I actually think their manufacturing exists, but it's old technology, and I think they're going to have to evolve to new technology, which is what, what we believe. 
So yeah, our, the core of what we do is based on the manufacturing. Cristina? Okay, thank you very much for this uh, amazing presentation. Um, you know, I mean, I find it really interesting to develop this technology, of course, for quantum computing, but I'd be really curious if you see completely other products coming out of all this effort. You know, I'm thinking of the internet and the way it was born. Do you see something, maybe it is just, you know, people learning linear algebra, I don't know, you know, something completely remote to yeah, quantum computing. Yeah, I do, computing. I do. So they, I guess, um, there are things that we're working on at the moment which I think are very exciting. Um, so kind of hybrid models with classical, I think that's going to be an area that grows pretty quickly. Um, but then, you know, uh, honestly, lots of people have taken the technology we've done, not just for silicon, but germanium, and people are now looking at diamond and graphene. So it can be applied to lots of different materials with lots of different applications. So when we, when we started, I have to be honest, we, we made the wire and we found that it was very low resistivity and we didn't think anything of it, it was that's good for our quantum computer. And then it turned out that some of the big manufacturing lines started realizing that they could take their wires in industry and then put dielectrics around that were the same dielectric constant, which is what we essentially have found, but we didn't know that. And so they've started using a lot of that technology to make very low conducting wires. So already there are kind of applications coming out. Um, but we, honestly, we had this conversation in the company are we going to build the quantum computer or are we going to get distracted? And, you know, it's such a powerful long-term goal um, that we're on mission and we're letting other people kind of pick up stuff as we go along. But, yeah, who knows? It's, it's a constant question because something big could come out from all those other things, yeah. Marlene? Thank you very much for this amazing lecture. Um, so it looks like the big question is whether nature will let you... Uh, go this <laughs> big step further, but let's say it does. Yeah. Uh, will the uh, strongest driver of the acceleration of this adoption of the technology be driven by problems to solve, like the problems that are in the waiting room with classical computing and need this to actually be solved? Or do you think technology will be the accelerator, the, the challenge of making this better, and then in search of problems to solve? Oh, I don't, honestly, I think the problems are just stacking up. <laughs> and, so, and so we you know, we have an algorithm team that are constantly looking about which are the ones that are nearest term for us to work on. Um, and I think I've realized, having set up a company, that there's no point having technology if it's just sitting there, it has to be used. And so the end user and what they want it for is the total focus for us. So if we've got at least three or four that we're working on problems with at the moment and trying to look at things that are near term um, and then map out to when it's actually going to be commercially useful for them. So yeah, I think the problems are going to come thick and fast they, when they already are. Every time we talk to somebody, there's a whole bunch of problems they've got. There's a question there from Jean-Philippe. Yeah, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. This string of breakthroughs at the, at the rapid pace, it, it's really impressive. And so I'm, I'm it, first it speaks volume about your, your vision and your leadership, but I also assume it takes a wonderful um, uh, infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, but also I would think um, at this point, there's like a, a whole campus culture. Um, <laughs> can you tell us about how, how this is happening through through master's programs and, yeah, yeah. and exchanges between the campus and the company and things like this? Yeah, Thank I haven't you. really talked about the company. So we, when we set the company up, I guess in Australia, we don't have a lot of companies. So in Europe, you're very blessed that you have a startup culture and the US has that as well. In Australia, it really is the opposite. So setting up a company is, is quite um, unusual. And so when we started, it was really driven by what what do we need to be successful? So there was a roadmap that I made about these are all the infrastructure, these are the kind of people we need, and it was mapping it out. And so then we actually formed the company inside the university, which again was quite unusual for Australia, and it's lots of boundaries have had to be broken to make that work. Um, but fundamentally, I really believe that that is useful and a good way to go, because the technology is not at the point where we have a, a blueprint and we just make it and stamp it out and give it to people. There's a lot of development work, and you need to have 
teams of people at all those different levels of expertise. So in that full stack, we literally have mathematicians, computer scientists, hardware engineers, they're, and their culture is unbelievably different. And so for me, the most exciting thing, and I, you know, I, I love working with people. Yeah, as much as I love the technology, I love working with people and getting the best out of them. And so then having these meetings with all the different teams and recognizing like it's a completely different language. And then how do those teams actually work together? And so we've created for us a company that's on in, in one building, it's on one floor, it's open plan, so everyone's able to talk to each other. And then I've literally had to figure out how do I get, you know, these you know, mathematicians that don't really like talking to anyone to talk to the hardware guys. And and it's been it's been a journey. It's been an absolute amazing journey. And so I realized at the core of that, if you can see something that's bigger than you, so we've got the whole computer architecture and everyone's everyone has a role in building it. If you can see something bigger than you and you can learn something from other people, everyone wants to learn and they're learning the whole how do you operate it, how does it work? And then you have fun fun is the core ingredient to all of that so that everyone comes to work because they really want to be there you know that's and so for me that building that culture has been fantastic and then with the university having to break down the barrier of having a company there and you know everything is different for the company we have to have some level of confidentiality you know we um, the way we purchase things, the way we hire, we have to hire with different salaries, the higher salaries. How does the university deal with us? It's been a total battle, honestly, to get that working. But now they've realized that they've got students in year one, two, three, four, coming in and doing internships in and out of the company who are super happy, who are then telling all their friends and everyone else is coming. And so they've realized actually, hey, this is really working. So it's, it's been an arduous process to change their view. But now they literally have got lots of companies that they're building inside their, their walls. And that's been great. Students love it because they literally do the, the lecture and they come and they apply it. And that's pretty satisfying yeah, for a young person. So. Thank you. Um, maybe my question is for uh, every speaker. So to celebrate the second quantum revolution, do we still need more fundamental theories in physics or the majority work is just engineering and uh, well the development of the quantum technology put forward new challenges to the theoretical phys phys physics thank you who wants to start i actually wanted to ask the same question later on <laughs> i actually wanted to maybe add something to your question i actually wonder if as we're doing if when or, or how quantum computing can enable us to come up with the, um, to, to deepen our, our understanding of fundamental physics and actually get us to come to the next question, to the next technology, the next big technology, if, if that is something that's going to happen. But I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, it's also a very good question. I think we don't know yet. I mean, I probably reformulate what you just said, but um, we don't know yet whether what's important is what we do in order to perhaps one day have a quantum computer and therefore develop all these wonderful things that we have seen or whether it will just be a step towards something else and once that something else is delivered everything else will have been considered okay just you know preparation work and at the moment we don't know but i mean as academic scientist i'm i'm very happy about just seeing the next step and if so far at least i can speak for myself but Every time you do something that has never been tried before, you learn something new, which is valuable as such. And that's why also it's fun to do that. Um. Michelle, and this will be the final word. So I, so the, the reason why I love this question is I actually just gave a lecture in Australia on this. Um, and it was, it was um, going back to that, night, that famous photograph in 1927 in the Solvay conference, where there are 39 people, and I think 17, no, 20, 29 people. 29 people and 17 won the Nobel Prize, and so it was, you know, it was, you know, Heisenberg, Max Planck, Marie Curie, uh, it was all the famous quantum physicists. And if you look at that photograph, it's quite stark in the fact that it's, you know, it, it's, it's an, a picture of its time. So it's mainly it's mainly men, it's mainly Europeans, very few Americans, ironically, in that in that picture. Um, but then in in those days, they were mainly theorists. So most of the people in the quantum field at the beginning, the ones that came up with all the ideas, all the theory, were theorists, yeah? And so I think what's happened now is that in order to be able to, you know, we now have technology that can actually test 
some of their theories at the most fundamental level, we're actually at the point where we can really try some of their ideas in, with the precision that we would need to prove or disprove it. And so I do see now we're in a technological age where the experimentalists are now kind of rising up because there's just so many challenges and so many experiments to do. But, and so the theorists now have to become more real. <laughs> They have to look at the theories that apply to the stuff that we're getting, so they have to, it has to be messy, it can't be pure theory anymore. So they are always going to be fundamentally useful, but I think you'll see a rise of the experimentalist over the next you know, 10 to 15 years. And, and I would hesitate to say it's engineering, because nothing, you know, you're, you have technological capability. I wouldn't call it engineering. Engineering makes it sound like you're just stamping it out. But there's so many fundamental challenges, theoretically, and experimentally, as well as engineering. So it's, it's a mixture of everything, but it's all coming together. So thank you very much for this uh, fantastic discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank Paradisa and Jean-Philippe, also you, Michel, for the nice discussion. There is plenty of time afterwards to uh, come to you and discuss, so please stay afterwards. And now it's the time to give you the award. And uh, Ale please join Alexandra. Thank you. 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 Scale. So That's a mouthful. We, yeah, it's a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much. Our foundation doesn't have a big fund, so we are not a noble committee with a million. So we give us Swiss chocolate and a small pen. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Is that for me? <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, with this, you are invited to the Apero after, and uh, thank you very much for contributing and for being with us. And uh, don't forget to take a flyers with you and uh, help us with funding so that we can fund more students to go abroad and to bring great science back. Thank you.